All right, so this is the second part of our lecture for uh, PA students on knee and leg uh, injuries and disease. So um, we're going to pick up now with knee fractures. So four main fractures I want you to be aware of, and we'll go through each of those. A couple of general principles I think with knee fractures you need to keep in mind. Firstly, they're frequently intra-articular fractures, right? So they occur inside the knee joint, therefore they can lead to hemarthrosis. Uh, they have all the implications of intra-articular fractures, that is they often uh, can require surgery uh, and the intra-articular component uh, sometimes requires very demanding uh, reconstruction of the articular surface to get it anatomic. They can cause significant disability so, um, you know, if they don't heal properly, the patient may not be able to walk well, may have a lot of stiffness. And as I kind of hinted, they're frequently treated with surgery, especially if a fracture is displaced or angulated. Certainly not always, but um, let's see, for surgery is not, not uncommon for these. So let's just say a few words about distal femur fractures. So um, here is a... Uh, this is just a, happens to be a classification scheme. I don't think you need to know this, but it just shows some of the fracture patterns that we commonly see with distal femur fractures. And you see you can have fractures uh, such as these here that uh, the fracture is not even going into the joint. I mean, they can get very complicated, but fracture doesn't go into the knee joint. Whereas you can have these other fractures, like all of these here, where you have uh, varying degrees of intra-articular involvement. Uh, it's a femur fracture though, uh, and certainly if you extend up towards the femoral shaft, uh, you can have significant blood loss. Okay, so this is not a finger fracture, it's a femur, you can have a lot of bleeding, and uh, it's one of the things you have to keep in mind um, when managing these patients. Uh, I would submit to you that they, they should usually be admitted to the hospital. So there's not a lot of femur fractures that I think uh, uh, you can just comfortably say can be sent home. I'm sure there's some exceptions, but by and large, you should be asking yourself, uh, is there any reason why this patient should not be admitted to the hospital? Uh, I think a default typically is they're going to get admitted. And they usually require some kind of surgical treatment. It could be open reduction internal fixation. Uh, could be plates, screws. It could be an intramedullary nail. and you know, certainly the uh, fractures like this uh, up here could be treated with an intramedullary nail, whereas um, you know, a fracture like this here is probably going to be fixed with some type of screws or plate and screws, right? But uh, they often require surgical treatment. What about patella fractures? So, you know, this is a lateral lecture of the knee. I'm hoping you can clearly make out uh, the two major fragments here. Uh, so what's the what's the big thing about patella fractures? Well, they, it's, they can cause loss of extensor function of the knee. Okay, so this person, if they get this displaced patella fracture, most likely will not be able to extend the knee. Okay, um, that's not good, but What's even worse is that if you just keep in mind, when you stand on the knee, any little thing that causes your knee to just bend slightly from the fully extended position, um, you require your quadriceps, you require your muscle up here connecting to your kneecap, uh, connecting to the tibia here to keep your leg straight and, and prevent it from buckling backwards. So when you lose this extensor mechanism, it's very difficult to even just stand because just the slightest rocking of this tibia back and you can't control it. And uh, the knee kind of buckles and just completely gives way. So it's very disabling. And um, uh, this is uh, frequently something that uh, will lead to this loss of extensor function. and. The clinical presentation is very similar to a patellar tendon or quadriceps tendon rupture, right? So your, your quadriceps is basically disconnected from the tibia. So here's your infrapatellar tendon, and it's basically not connected to the quads up here anymore. So you lose that extensor function. Now, it can be temporized in a knee immobilizer, right? So if you just hold the leg straight and prevent this tibia from, from 
from going back. So you put it in a in a, in a knee brace, and the knee brace doesn't move anywhere. This person can probably walk around on that, um, but um, that's not a great long-term solution. And uh, if it's displaced like this, it requires open reduction internal fixation. And a lot of times, what that means is taking this um, piece and uh, bringing it back up here, and um, you know, probably fixing this maybe with some pins or some kind of wire across here and reestablishing the sort of extensor mechanism um, from the uh, thigh down to the proximal tibia. Here's a tubercle here. I should draw this a little bit differently. Okay. Knee avulsion fractures. Well, it's an avulsion, right? So these involve many of the bony insertion of ligaments or tendons around the knee. So here, this one's subtle. It's hard to see. There's actually a small fragment there. So this is actually an avulsion of the anterior cruciate ligament on the anterior tibia. Um, you can have avulsions elsewhere. You can have avulsion of the insertion of the posterior cruciate ligament on the tibia, for example. You can have an avulsion of a portion of the fibular head. Uh, you can uh, have an avulsion from the, you know, let's just say, proximal lateral tibia, the, the iliotibial band. Um, so, but the point is, it's some type of ligament or tendon pulling and pulling a piece of, of bone off. Now, because that's a ligament's insertion point, all right, so let's say if you had this avulsion here, like in this x-ray, well, the ACL is trying to insert on the tibia, and now you've basically avulsed the insertion off. Well, now that ACL is no longer attached to the tibia, and you effectively have like an ACL tear without actually tearing the ligament. So it can result in knee instability. Um, usually these can be treated temporarily in a knee immobilizer, uh, and it de depends on the severity of the injury and whether uh, it has a chance to heal. So for instance, an avulsion like this, um, uh, maybe you put the knee in full extension, this fragment maybe settle, settles down to a reasonable position, and you might actually get bone-to-bone -bone healing. So as opposed to an ACL tear, which usually doesn't heal on its own, uh, bone often can heal, and sometimes um, it might heal up okay, and now that ligament um, integrity is restored. Um, but that may not always be the case, so these sometimes can require surgical repair. What about tibia plateau fractures? So uh, here is also, this is just sort of showing a classification scheme for tibia plateau fractures. I don't expect you to have that all memorized or anything, but just, just to get a sense of the type of fractures you might see. Uh, you can have anything from uh, sort of this single split to a very comminuted uh, fracture with the articular fractures on medial and lateral sides, and also this so-called metadiaphyseal dissociation, very unstable fracture. The other thing is with tibial plateau fractures, what you can get is this so-called uh, depression. It's very common, actually, depressed fracture. So what's happening here, hopefully you can get the sense from the cartoon, what ha what's happening here is the bone is supposed to be up here, okay, and it gets crushed, depressed, or sort of sinks. It's kind of like a pothole almost. In this case, they show the entire lateral plateau being pushed down, but in reality, uh, what happens oftentimes is, um, so let's just say, um, let's just say this is our, this is our tibia. So a lot of times what happens is you may have a depression like this. And just can't really erase the whole thing very easily. Anyhow, you have a depression like this or a pothole or something, and then the articular surface that's supposed to be up there is down here. And what you have to do oftentimes is decide if that's too much, you have to push it back up with a surgical procedure to get the joint surface back to where it needs to be. So imagine um, if you have you know, this whole condyle is off and you have this big pothole like you do here, it can cause knee instability, right? Because what's on the other end of this, what's on the other end of this femur, right? I'm, I'm sorry, what's on the other end of this tibia is the femur, right? So you have, you know, the femur is 
sitting like this, right? And um, if you have, if it's, if the tibia is supposed to be here, and instead it's here, you can you can imagine that you're going to get this sort of play or instability that it's going to fall into this defect. Or if you have, you can you can argue if you have this fracture, right? And then this fragment goes down. You have this huge step off, perhaps. And uh, again, the femur is going to fall into this gap. So it can cause knee instability. It can be very disabling. Another important thing is that um, it is a tibia fracture. Um, and you can get bleeding into the compartments of the tibia, I'm sorry, of the leg. So compartment syndrome is something that can happen with tibia plateau fractures. Uh, so um, it can happen with any fracture, but and tibia fractures you worry about in particular. So tibia plateau fractures, one thing you got to think about is compartment syndrome. Now, I would say these usually should be admitted to the hospital, uh, certainly if you're worried that something like compartment syndrome could occur. Uh, certainly at our hospital, all tibia plateau fractures get admitted unless there's some really, really good reason to not admit the patient. But by and large, our protocol is to admit all of them. They do frequently require open reduction internal fixation. Not in all cases, but there are some parameters we use uh, that you don't have to know, but um, just keep in mind they frequently can require fixation. All right, let me talk a little bit about uh, soft tissues, uh, soft tissue injuries of the knee, and then we'll split up and then do uh, one last video to finish up. Meniscal tears. So uh, here is just an example of a variety of different meniscal tears that you can get. You don't have to have all these memorized, but just keep in mind. So we're looking sort of from the top down at the meniscus um, in each example here. And you can see all the different tears. You can get like this uh, radial tear here. You can get the um, uh, so-called uh, you know, bucket handle tear where uh, you get this entire fragment displaced like that. Uh, and a variety of different tears, but it's a cartilage tear. Now keep in mind the um, if you think about how the uh, so let's just say you have this is the femur and this is the tibia. Okay, and I didn't even really draw it that round, but you really have a very small area of point contact, right? Well, what the meniscus does, and the meniscus is a little bit is shaped like this. I'm just showing this in cross-section. This is like a lateral image or a sagittal image of the knee. So that meniscus in there, it helps increase that contact surface area between the tibia and the femur and facilitates efficient transfers of uh, forces across the knee joint. That's its function. Now it can get torn, particularly with twisting injuries uh, in, in a younger healthy patient, although in somebody w who's um, may have degenerative disease in the knee, in an older patient, they can get degenerative tears with minimal or no trauma. And that's very common. In fact, more often than not, those are the tears you actually will see in clinical practice, unless you have a big sports population. Uh, you can get pain, mechanical symptoms such as clicking, locking, or catching, and these mechanical symptoms are important because these are the ones that can be very um, difficult sometimes to treat non-surgically. On physical exam, you can have joint line tenderness. Uh, you may also have a positive McMurray test, although it's not the most sensitive test. Uh, MRI is very helpful to confirm. Uh, here's an example that you might be looking at to, to confirm, for instance, that you, you have this tear in the meniscus or not. These can be treated with rehabilitation, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, in younger patients, they may require surgical repair. Um, and in general, they can require surgery if you have mechanical symptoms, meaning catching, locking. Otherwise, if you have a patient with degenerative disease and just has a degenerative tear, it's very questionable whether surgery is helpful in those cases. Okay, last thing for this particular video, and then we'll finish up in the next one, is ACL or anterior cruciate ligament tears. So the ACL is the prime stabilizer of 
anterior tibia translation, right? So if you, if you look at how the ligament is oriented, it's preventing the tibia from going that way to check rein. It can rupture with rotational non-contact injuries as well as hyperextension and other mechanisms. So there's a lot of ways this, uh, that this can happen. Um, I mean, there's certainly, you can watch videos on the internet of people, uh, football players getting ACL tears with all kinds of people crashing into them. Um, but uh, very commonly, this can occur with no contact, and it's one of the injuries that can be very devastating that actually can happen with non-contact situations. Um, that is, like the person that nobody's crashing into the person at all, they just kind of take a step, something happens, and uh, um, they go down, and you have to worry about an ACL in those situations. So an injury can also result in tears of the meniscus or other ligaments. So you know, these can occur in isolation, but they can also occur in combination with other soft tissue injuries. So diagnosis is made um, with the patient perhaps telling you they felt a pop in the knee and developed very rapid swelling and an effusion. It's often hemarthrosis and it can result in instability. So afterwards, when the patient tries to walk on it, they might notice that the knee wants to twist or turn, or they have to be very cautious about, cautious about how they uh, take a step, or maybe they don't want to take a step off of a curb because they feel like the knee is going to buckle or give out. On exam, the main test you're looking for is a positive Lachman test. I'm going to go back because it's shown over here. Here's the Lachman test being shown. Femur is being stabilized. Tibia is being translated anteriorly. And you, what you can also do is you can also push the femur posteriorly while you do this. Actually, that's, that's shown here. Um, so a good Lachman test, you're pushing back here. You're pulling forward here. And you're looking to see how much does the tibia go anteriorly. Now, other tests include the anterior drawer test, excuse me, or uh, pivot shift test. Anterior drawer test is a little less sensitive. Pivot shift is a little bit difficult to elicit, can be very painful, and um, it's something we often do in the operating room under anesthesia, but some patients in the office, um, you can elicit this as well. Uh, treatment is often surgical uh, in younger athletic patients with instability, although um, they're not always going to be treated with surgery, and certainly in an older sedentary patient without instability, I think would be a good case for non-surgical management, okay? All right, so I'm going to pause there, and we'll pick up with uh, the remainder of this in the last video. Thanks.